Madam Chair, staff is ready to begin when you are. Thank you, ma'am. I'll call to order the Town of Hilton Head Island Board of Zoning Appeals uh, special meeting. Um, today it's board training and the date is Thursday, April 29, 2021 at 10.07 a.m. And with that, I'll ask Ms. Haley if we are in compliance with FOIA. Yes, ma'am, we are. Uh, for the purpose of establishing a quorum, will you call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Mr. White? We see you, John, but I think you're muted. Present, I'm sorry. Thank you. Dr. Ponder? Present. Mr. Johnson? Mr. Johnson? Present. Present. Thank you. Ms. Bryson? Present. And for the record, Ms. Loudermilk, Mr. Walzak, and Mr. Fingerhut are excused. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, today, uh, we are uh, having legal training by Staff Attorney Diane Bush uh, for the purpose of um, fulfilling hours of training required by Board of Zoning Appeals members, um, and also for those of us who may have hours who are still inquisitive. <laughs> so, um, and, and Ms. Bush, uh, thank you for the documents uh, you sent to us, um, and uh, I hope that um, uh, other members of the board, I have received them. I hope you did receive the two uh, documents that were sent this morning. Um, if anyone has not uh, received those, uh, it'd probably be good to let us know so that Ms. Haley could send again. Anybody? There are two documents, um, and uh, one is an unnecessary hardship worksheet, and the other is a conflict of interest worksheet. Okay, hearing none, Ms. Bush, we will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Diane Bush, for the record, staff attorney for the town of Hilton Head Island. Um, I have to give credit to Chair Bryson for that worksheet because I found it in the um, exhibits from the municipal courts um, proposed or uh, model documents, which is where I know you found your rules and procedures. So thank you for that. That's where that came from. You're welcome. All right. All right. Are y'all able to see the screen? Uh, yes, I am. Any, anybody having trouble with the screen sharing from Ms. Bush? Okay, you may proceed. Thank you, ma'am. I crafted this seminar largely around what happens should a case be appealed to the 14th Circuit Court. So that's, that's how we are um, the vantage that this comes from and I'm starting from the basics and actually had to go back and rework this after several meetings listening to y'all that um, I was far too elementary. Um, y'all are very knowledgeable. So you all know you are a quasi-judicial body that means as if as though plus the judges. Don't confuse that with Mr. Quasimodo over here. <laughs> Given that you have your, you are judicial, you are expected to abide by all of the conditions that a single judge would, which include no ex parte communications, that you are the finder and the sole finder of the facts, you rule based on facts as applied to law. And then why I sent you the conflict avoidance form, um, be, be wary of conflicts. Your rulings can't, can't be based on popular political opinion, sympathizing with an applicant. It doesn't mean you leave common sense at home, but 
you're going to see the theme through this presentation as well is keeping a record of your findings why you you ruled as you did is is important the standard of review when a case goes up to the 14th circuit is very much in favor of the board findings and in fact the the Decision must be allowed to stand unless there's no evidence which reasonably supports the finding. In this case, this is a Hilton Head Island case, the applicant argued that the letter that the board provided um, with their ruling was actually one, one sentence. That was the entirety of their, their written ruling and the applicant argued that it did not satisfy the statute that it was not clearly um, enumerated. And the court said, no, they, it's one statement is fine because the, the balance and the explanations of the board was clearly laid out in the transcript of the hearing. So when read with the letter, it provided a sufficient basis for the court to determine whether or not the board ruled properly. Again, the record. Everything that, that you're finding, you're discussing, all of that is part of the record. I, I wouldn't recommend the one sentence um, decisions, but this is, how, this is how strongly the Court of Appeals holds the, the fact-finding part of, um, of your board. So here, um, setting out what is evidence. Um, you've got the applicant presentation, the application, their exhibits, staff reports and exhibits, any testimony, any recorded documents, and then input from interested parties. The important thing to keep in mind is there's a difference between which evidence is admissible and in in a BZA hearing, you, you've got much more latitude in terms of whether or not you're going to allow something to come in than, than you would be stuck with the typical rules of evidence. But the d important distinction to make is that while it all can come in, you and only you are the determiners of what weight to give the evidence. If you find somebody's testimony that's just, you find a a whole bunch of malarkey, you can discount part of it, all of it, what, whatever, whatever the court feels or the board feels, the weight should be given to that evidence. So what is an evidence? Facts from, as you find them, not opinions. You've got to you look for facts and opinions about the law of anybody else is is not evidence and while you may listen to the arguments it's a, it's not evidence it's that is entirely within your purview to determine the facts and apply those facts to the law as you find it so the takeaway again is perfect the record state your factual findings adopt a present uh, either the applicant staff a hybrid and then you, after that, you don't, you really don't have to worry about it. The record keeping will be maintained by staff, and they know exactly what needs to be sent up to the 14th Circuit if that is um, required. So as you know, you've got these four areas over which you have have power. So to first err to hear and decide the appeals where it's alleged that there was an, an error from staff. Um, of course, the one you, you see the most is a, um, the unnecessary hardship argument for a variance, the special use exceptions, and then whether or not the, the matter is remanded to staff and then comes back before you for a, a second hearing. You've got authority to hear and decide appeals 
when there's an allegation and you find that it's correct from an order, a decision, or determination by staff. Keep in mind that the burden of proof to show the hardship as we move into variances is with the applicant. The first prong of the three of the four conditions is the con, is a condition at issue extraordinary and exceptional. Of course, you, you all know this part of the things to consider for the, the property itself. And when you're deciding these conditions, it appears to me that it could come to pulling your hair out. I've got some photos of properties that that clearly don't apply to other properties in the vicinity. You've got some commercial buildings, apartments perhaps, and a church in the middle. In terms of figuring out what is property in the vicinity, the fact that some other um, property has the same problem does not immediately exclude your your the property your consideration from being um, that it that the conditions don't apply to other property in the vicinity. So this this case is a um, often quoted case, and the language of the statute was different back when it was um, decided. But I think it's a good sort of um, overview or looking for what the court at that time to so the language was peculiar rather than uh, not to the property in the vicinity but the court came out up with some distinctions and so, and found that peculiar doesn't mean unique but it could be a situation that's unusual odd rare or strongly deviating from the norm Again, more. this is more from the, the Sullivan's Island case that they were finding that peculiar is too narrow, that it could mean unique, exclusive, it could also be the other language, unusual, rare, odd, strongly deviating from the norm. I've, I've included this even though the statute has changed because I think that the the considerations of the, pro of the property still the language still uh, applies. And then your next condition, because of the conditions, the, appl the application of the ordinance to the property would effectively prohibit or unreasonably restrict the utilization. So this, this condition is looking towards the consequences if the BZA did not permit the variance. Importantly, this holding is repeated in a multitude of cases as well, that it, if the property may be used more profitably, if a variance were to be granted, is not to be considered. Um, what if the owner's proposed resolution would allow him to come into compliance with a restricted use? The Court of Appeals and then the Supreme Court followed up that um, the BZA in uh, Lexington County is finding that the property was extraordinary and exceptional because a fabrication facility existed to the prior to the property being zoned. And the board determined that the buffering restrictions created setbacks that made it impossible for any ex any feasible expansion or improvements. So if you look to what the property was used for and if a zoning uh, ordinance comes in and changes it, then it's, it's, it has to be considered. So finally, the prong that looks to how, how is this going to impact or not the um, public 
good the character of the district is it going to negatively impact adjacent property here i think you might agree that the candy cane house doesn't look so good with what you can see in the background another example you've got residential homes here and a factory So in, in Rush versus the city of Greenville, the court held, which is also a very consistent holding, that it's proper to take into consideration the effect of granting a variance on the public in general. When you are looking at modifying a otherwise appropriate restriction in the exceptional case it becomes more that restriction becomes more burdensome than it can be modified so long as it's not impairing the the uh, public purpose i'm sorry i'm looking for the facts of the Pollock case. I'm going to move on. Again, some more case law. The board is not free to make a determination as to whatever it appeals to your sense of judgment. You've still got to abide by and comply with the standards set out by local ordinance and zoning statutes. Consider whether the hardship was self-imposed. The courts repeatedly hold consistently that if, if the owner's hardship was self-created or self-inflicted, that they can't later come, come along and, and ask for a variance based on hardship. In this case, Oh, my, my screens are, in the case that, was, that is cited um, here, the Rush case, the property owner bought um, Looks like the screen jumped back to the Char Stevenson versus Charleston case. It, okay. It, whoops. The other direction, maybe. <laughs> like backing up a trailer sometimes. Yeah, I think we went backwards again. All right. Here we go. So in in the the Hodge case, the case. Um, was about a request to allow a, a shorter side yard setback from the road rather than the current because the building was to house equipment for a particular tenant. And what happened was many of the neighbors jumped on board and in, in essence started to run home uh, businesses and they were actually physicians. And then they came along and applied for a variance and the, and the court uphold, upheld the BZA ruling in denying it, that they were in essence becoming the, the maker of their, their own hardship by trying to, to expand on a variance granted to um, a, a, a different neighbor. Diane. All right, now back to Stevenson. Diane. Ms. Bush, yes. I think we have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, question. Um, would that suggest that if someone were to buy 
a property um, that is not in compliance today, can they in fact seek a variance when they know when they knew at the outset that they were not in compliance? That's a great question. Um, in in my research, I've seen it both ways. That um, many of the many of the cases, the court of appeals has held. No, you knew the condition was there. You bought it with that understanding. You're stuck with it. In some of the others, depending on when the ordinance was adopted, if the if the ordinance was adopted post purchase, then then entirely different situation. Um, but and I think I've got a case on that actually, but that's correct. Um, if you if you bought it and you knew that it had the condition, you can't come along and claim, oh, I bought it this way, and so now let me fix it. Does that answer the question? It does, uh, because it strikes me that we've had many of those circumstances. I, I would agree. I would absolutely agree. Um, I think that with this holding, you've still got to run through all the other conditions. And if they meet the conditions independently, then fine. But if what they're arguing is that I have this hardship, except they, they bought the property knowing of the hardship, then I, I, I think that the, the case law would support a finding of no, you 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 knew, so you can't later come along and say, oh gosh, I inherited it this way. And I, I've got a case um, that actually speaks directly to that. I'm not sure when it's going to pop up, but we're headed that way. So, and I guess I should have asked all along if anybody's got any questions. Uh, thanks, Ms. Bush. I think we're not too shy a group, so I think <laughs> we'll we'll jump in if we if we desire to. So thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So this is back to the the self created hardship. So this this is the case. A property owner bought in this case a piece of uh, bought a parcel, and he had. 50 feet of frontage on Route 17. The ordinance mandated that a minimum frontage was 50 feet. He wanted to sell a piece of his property, but there was no way to sell it with with a 50 with 50 front uh, 50 feet frontage because that's all there was. And the the court found that he created the hardship as he knew when he bought the property it would remain one parcel. And let me jump in again. Uh, would it also suggest that ignorance is not an excuse? That's correct. And, and, and I think there are times when people truly don't know um, and, and they've gotten wrong information from their property owners association or whatever, perhaps a real estate agent. Um, and I think you've got to ferret that out. Um, I, I don't know how the board knew in this case um, that the owner was aware of the 50 foot frontage requirement, but they did. Somehow it came out in the hearing. And they, they denied it and it was upheld. So again, back to hardships aren't hardships if they're self-created. Here I've got this enormous house that backs up to a cell phone tower, no, no place for a yard, um, a pool, and that they, they created this themselves by putting this enormous house and then to complain about the cell phone tower or the um, looking for variances to move into setbacks is is not going to work.
All right, and then to special exemptions, I think these, of course, are, are less um, at issue than the variances. Um, Another slide on that. In the Bantam case, the court reversed the board's denial of special exception to residential halfway house for released federal prisoners. And what the court concluded was that the board decision was based on a fears of the neighbors rather than the evidence. And the evidence offered from the perspective of the reviewing court was that um, the applicant was able to show satisfaction of, of the variance or of the ordinance or a special, uh, a special use. So on to um, remanding and, and rehearing. You all know the, the time frame. Um, Again, we're back to record keeping. Keep a list of the of those who were interested and make sure that they're noticed when the matter is set for rehearing. Notice must be mailed to these folks prior to the rehearing. In determining whether or not it is appropriate for the court to remand and to rehear or reconsider, I think we've all agree agreed that it truly is a rehearing because new evidence can, can come in. Um, and that's, in essence, the, the reason for it. But the, the courts repeatedly find that if the board thinks that they can resolve something or further clarify, Absolutely, they have every right to do that. So these these are rarely going to draw any kind of um, reversal. And and the, the, the reason is from a practical standpoint, the reviewing court doesn't want to hear it if it can be resolved by by the BZA. Uh, Ms. Bush, this is Ms. Bryson. Um, this is where we're looking at our rules of procedure uh, because we've been troubled by trying to understand the standard uh, when we have a rehearing um, to make a different decision from the previous decision. And we've been looking at uh, the possibility of changing that rule to um, uh, rehearing uh, based on uh, new evidence and not on the standard that is in the um, current rules. Um, so how, how would that affect what you've seen in the case law? I think that the, um, in, in terms of terminology, it would seem to me that, that the motion by the applicant would be for reconsideration, but what you're actually doing is having a rehearing. And again, it's really up to the board, but they're going to allow to be presented. If what you're hearing is a repeat of what you've heard before, um, you know, maybe listen, but don't give it any, any further weight than you did originally. But with new evidence, absolutely um, let it in. You, it, basically, I, I think, and as we saw um, on Tuesday, the, the, or Monday rather, that the board wants as much information as they can get to rule. They, they, they want as many facts and as many different vantages in order to rule. And if you find that something you've heard now has new information or there's an allegation, something, some uh, facts were misinterpreted law was misconstrued, you, you can hear it again. And what this state says is that they, they are not going to, um, or this case rather, adopt a bright line rule which usurps your power to correct matters. They, they, the, the reviewing courts want the BZA 
to if there's something new, if there's something challenge, they they want it to stay here and for you to rehear it. So uh, Missy Missy has been working on um, sort of tightening up and changing some of the things in your rules and, and and procedures, and this is absolutely, I think, appropriate for it. Okay, I, I think the, the question, and maybe y'all are looking at this separately, and, and so maybe you ought to defer that, but the question is, um, our rule now calls for a motion for reconsideration and not a rehearing based on new evidence. So the reconsideration, um, uh, the, the standard is whether or not um, there have been points that have been overlooked or misinterpreted by the board. And uh, we had some recent ones, with, and the standard was very confusing to the board. So I think what we're trying to do, and hopefully we will do with amendment to the rules of procedure, is to clear that up and to consider whether or not to go to a standard for rehearing based solely on new evidence and not on this kind of language in our current rules. Um, so I didn't know whether any of the case law you'd looked at might help us out with deciding which way to go. What I'm, what I'm reading is consistent with what you see here. And this is not a, um, a local opinion, but it it's, comes up in a number of different cases. This is just was the uh, most comprehensive and, and clear that the the board the board has the power to rehear and, and I, I I agree rehearing is the proper terminology because you're you're not reconsidering what you vote or you may be. I mean that could be part of it, but basically what you're looking for is something new. Tell us something that we haven't seen before. Okay, and and I think you. we can I think we can craft some language that'll make that clear. But what the court is saying is that there isn't there isn't a rule. They're they're not going to hold the board to um, particularly when the board decides to grant a rehearing. Okay. They're they're not going to hold you to whether um, the matters were neglected or whether they. It's it's pretty broad, but I think that the the from your perspective, if you've already ruled on a a uh, evidence that was presented, it doesn't make sense to rehear that. That you what you are looking for is something new, something that wasn't presented, um, and that you've got a lot of latitude on whether you hear evidence that could have been discovered or couldn't have been discovered at the time or something has changed um, to rehear it. But I, th I think we can work on crafting the language to make it a little bit clearer. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. This case, um, Restaurant Row, and, and I can send you for whoever has any interest. It is it is cited repeatedly and for a multitude of different holdings. Um, one of the ones that it looked at was a, a uh, constitutional issue of due process. And 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 I'll, I'll if you don't mind, quick tell you the facts. The Restaurant Row um, owned a, a company that, or a subsidiary that, that began as an adult attainment, entertainment business in 1989, in, or 1988. In 1989, the county adopted an ordinance establishing zoning regulations for these types of uh, businesses. They gave a six-year amortization period um, and ended up with a an ordinance that prohibited such entertainment within 500 feet of any residential area. This company um, or establishment 
was at the time a non-conforming use because it had 350, it was 350 feet from a, a residence, but that residence or that zoning was, the only thing there at the time was a golf course. There were no, no homes. And that 350 feet was inter, uh, Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway. Um, so they, they argued that they, the, the um, zoning director sent, or administrator sent a letter saying, you've got until January 1st of 1995 to cease this use. They responded with three different petitions, which is partially why there's so, there's so many holdings out of it. One was for a variance from the setback and uh, the other amortization provisions. The um, oddly, the zoning administer at that time made no re recommendation to either approve or deny the variance. Um, I, I, I couldn't glean from the facts why. They had a paid consultant who testified and the board heard public comments. The board denied the request. It went to the 14th circuit. They upheld the, the ruling. In essence, they were asking to be grandfathered in. Um, they, they held that the variance request was arbitrary and um, clearly erroneous in light of any lack of evidence on the golf course uh, or of any residents on the golf course or, and the natural barrier was water. The Court of Appeals reversed and upheld the BZA findings that the, the um, entity did not show unnecessary hardship. Oh, where is the rest of that case? And it did go up to the South Carolina Supreme Court who reversed again. And uh, many, many of the holdings are, for example, that there's a strong presumption in favor of the validity of application of zoning ordinances, um, which is related back here to the constitutional issue. And that a court will refrain, refrain from substituting its judgment for that of the BZA. You've always got to keep this in mind, but unless you're, you, what you've found is cap capricious, arbitrary, no relation to the law, or if you've abused or some other misconduct, um, the, the reviewing courts are not going to disturb the factual findings. I included this because we, we've had uh, mediation questions. Um, obviously the, the code provides for it. And if you notice the language, if the appellant requests, the mediation must be granted. Um, what happens during those meeting, those mediations? I, I, I don't know how much, um, other than Chair Bryson perhaps knows, I, I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence, um, but they will, typically it happens at the courthouse, um, the town with an attorney, any witnesses they feel appropriate, um, although, or any, um, a figure of authority is a better way to say it, because the, the, Although during a mediation conference, there's a good chance other facts that weren't brought up or other arguments or perspectives will, will come out. And the attorneys are gonna argue what, the, what they think the court is gonna do if it went forward with a full hearing. And the, the outcomes that, that they come, with, come out with are all over the place. Um, I would, expect that from your your vantage it's frustrating because you've in essence already hashed out these issues that probably are being hashed out between the two sides in a, in immediate with the help of a third party independent mediator depending on the outcome either it's a stalemate 
and it goes on and, and a regular hearing is held, or there's some kind of an agreement that's in place and it's not filed. Um, oftentimes, if the results of the agreement resolve the issue entirely, one or the other parties will uh, dismiss their appeal and it and there's there's not a, a record of it. So it's you know it's a it's a frustrating um, portion I think for a trial court in essence as you are to have something appealed but then to allow this intermediary process pop up and it does any any applicant would opt for mediation before going in front of a judge because it's a, it's basically another bite at the apple. Does, does that does that help or am I being too elementary? Do y'all have questions? I think the frustration not just by this BZA but previous BZA just described based on membership changing um, and by the community um, is that um, uh, perhaps those who are representing the town at a mediation, um, we, we are not exactly comfortable that the record and transcript have been reviewed carefully by those representing the town. Um, and um, uh, I, I think that um, the reason that we were interested in who participates in the mediation on behalf of the town is making sure that they are representing the interest um, of the town and the BZA. Um, and, and so that's been a bit frustrating, partic uh, particularly in the Arbor Nature case. I was not on the board at that time, um, but I know other members were, and uh, the community was very frustrated by the result of that mediation. Um, so I think that's what you're hearing from the current BZA about mediation process. Um, it's, um, it's a bit unusual in zoning cases in my experience. Um, I, I was a certified mediator, um, so I, I entirely applaud um, alternative dispute resolution, including arbitration. Um, but um, I, I think there's still frustration in the community, and um, I think this is a matter more of a matter of policy than exactly how the law applies um, at some sort of uh, better communication uh, about what is going on. Um, I appreciate the confidentiality and mediations, um, but I think that um, uh, to the extent that there can be communication prior to a mediation conference might be helpful. And I know there are some other board members who are not present now and they may have um, some more questions. I, I think the other thing that would be helpful for the BZA is to be kept updated about the status of ongoing matters uh, for two reasons. One is because we spend a lot of time trying to make a decision. And then the other is that if there is something that is pointed out um, or uh, either during a mediation that can be disclosed or um, in preparation for mediation, if there's any sort of um, uh, information uh, about problems with the board's procedure or application of the substantive law, then it would be helpful for us to know so we won't repeat a mistake. Um, so that's what I would say. And uh, other board members, I don't know whether anyone else has any comments or questions. Sounds like you can go on, Ms. Bush. Thank your pardon? Uh, it sounds like you can go on. I didn't hear any other questions or comments. Right. Well, I. I, I think that the, in the absence of any procedural changes that, that I'm not sure that the litigation or the, the med, um, mediation is necessarily looking at anything that the board did or didn't do. They, they've, they've got to be bound by, or they should be bound by the facts that the board found because that's what the Court of Appeals or the 14th Circuit Court would be bound by. They're, 
they've repeatedly repeatedly held that we're we're not going to disturb the facts that were found by the board that's their purview unless in those circumstances where it's arbitrary capricious etc I think that the the difficulty is also you don't know which cases are going to get appealed you don't know which cases if appealed will request mediation although I think it's a pretty solid position to take that there's a there's a good chance if it is appealed there there is going to be mediation that that the only thing I'm short of some kind of procedural change that the board can do is be meticulous in their record keeping which is it doesn't have to be in writing but but once once there's a motion made and an agreement as to what the facts are that it's that it's read into the record because that's that's what the 14th Circuit is going to look at and certainly ought to be at the forefront of any mediation because if they're looking at it as okay what's the court going to do that's exactly what they have to fall back on I think unfortunately the you know the mediations there's a lot of leeway there for them to resolve the issues as they see fit that the board doesn't doesn't have any way to weigh in on you know I I just wanted to sort of explain the process so that y'all could maybe visualize what's happening where you know these folks are gathering they're most of them familiar with the facts perhaps not as as well as you would like and they're they're looking to resolve the matter regardless of and and I don't think it's it's a look at what the BZA did or didn't do it's just more of how can we how can we resolve this without a hearing so that said I've gone through as I've told you what the repeated holdings in this restaurant row case has a lot of them that again they won't deserve disturb the fact findings so putting the facts into the record and not just just what people said what you found what what you found believable what the taking the puzzle pieces together what your puzzle at the end of the day looks like in terms of the facts that the reviewing court is going to look at the decision mostly whether or not it's correct as a matter of law so to the degree that you're able to enumerate we've this has met this condition because we find that the property is unique or or whatever the findings might be and if you look at it this way that the findings of facts must be treated the same way of finding a fact of a jury and the reviewing court can't take any additional evidence that's not to say that perhaps other things come in at mediation you know it's 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 a different animal so then I went through these are not particularly pertinent other than that they are from Hilton Head this property this is about a easement whether or not subservient property could basically stand in place of somebody who had gotten an easement by prescription which means it's just over a certain amount of years of use and no objections there's the court finds that yes you do in fact have an easement this this case where with the one sentence that it that was a Hilton Head case and what happened was the town issued a building permit for a single-family home it would happen to be a corner lot it was at Dune Lane and Jacana Street the permit was for 20 feet setback on one side and 10 for the other and the board determined that there was no greater traffic on either side therefore the applicant could choose 
and they did, and then a neighbor uh, appealed. The neighbor requested that that permit, or the, the permit was uh, appropriate rather, was the finding of the, of the board. The, the opponent claimed that it was not um, appropriate for the, that there was more traffic on one side and that a one sentence holding wasn't in, in accordance with South Carolina law. And, at the, and in addition to that, she requested that the court allow her to amend her original appeal and to add new grounds and a plat. And the court said, no, one sentence is okay as long as the record is, is supportive and sets forth the necessary facts and that you cannot bring in new evidence at the appellate level. So the, the, the takeaway, I think, consistently through this is that the facts are going to be viewed as the way you find them, and therefore they've got to be they've got to be perfected in the record. And then the the, the court uh, upheld the rest of the decision making that in terms of that the board found that the traffic flow was the same and and that nothing was going to change that fact. This case was of a local from a local liquor store that tried to get a lighted sign under the pretense of that the uh, at the time that the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission regulated their locations and that there was a requirement of the red dot signs and um, that they they wanted an exception and argued that the ordinance was um in a, a improper exercise of the town's police powers the court disagreed um stood behind the board it went all the way up to the supreme court and the takeaway from this i think is that the the ordinances that the town enacts are going to be presumed to be valid um, and within and constitutional, that, that the courts start, start off from, from that premise. Um, and in this case, of course, found that, that there was no uh, abuse of, of its uh, police powers. This case, I don't know that anything would come up, but this was um, also a Hilton Head case. The Hilton Head Planning Commission granted a development permit to this entity, um, a respondent who is a neighboring um, property owners association ob objected and appealed. The uh, BZA d denied, and the property owners association took it up to the 14th Circuit. The board argued that and and uh, moved to dismiss based on that this entity who was the permit holder was not party to the appeal and 14th circuit agrees agreed court of appeals reversed and supreme court went back and stood with 14th circuit and the bza um so in essence if you have a case where there is a missing party um and it's glaring that you you can subpoena them in. And I think the board's done that before. All right. This too, this is, we're now up to 1987, um, supportive of what the, the former case or the uh, liquor store case was talking about in terms of what latitude that governments have to enact ordinances. And it's, this one was actually against the ordinance um, because it wasn't drafted clearly and there wasn't it wasn't clear as to what was permitted and what wasn't. But in general, um, they uphold the ordinances as being constitutional. And in this case, the Court of Appeal found under a subsequent ordinance that it did apply. 
And that's the end of my presentation. I just wanted to, thanks Diane. This is Missy Lewick. I just wanted to add one thing that um, when Diane was going through the draft presentation with me, um, we just kind of um, verified like when we do have a case that goes to the 14th circuit, you know, the documents that we prepare that get sent on as the record. And that includes all of the public notice. So the ad, the mailing, the letter, um, the sign proof, the application materials, so everything from the applicant, um, the staff report, all of the attachments that go with the staff report, the notice of action, the proof of the notice of action mailing, um, public comment records, meeting minutes, the presentation, and we get we uh, order a transcript of the meeting. So everything that was said during the meeting is also part of the record. So that is that since the theme of Diane's presentation was record, um, just want to let you know that all of that is the record. So it's pretty much everything, everything in the packet, everything behind the scenes, the mailings and all of the public notice requirements, as well as minutes of the meeting and the actual transcript. And if, if I may follow up, um, Missy, thank you for expanding on that. Um, it's back to if all of this information is sent to the Court of Appeals, but there's no interpretation from the board as, as to what weight you've given to particular evidence, you'll, you, they'll, they'll kind of have to come to a conclusion of what facts you found and why you found them. So, you know, the extreme example is if you have an applicant that, that you think is not telling the truth. Um, that you don't have to rely on that. Or if there's a opponent who you don't think is telling the truth, and anybody that you think that the evidence, even though it's in the record and it's gonna go up, that you, you give it more or less weight as you feel appropriate. Um, that's certainly difficult to do, I think, in a, in a public hearing, um, but, in order to perfect the things that you relied on and that you believed are were important and were the facts not just what this um, you know because a lot a lot of things come in um that i i would recommend that the um that that be made clear that the court or or the the bza has looked at and you can even eliminate things and just not, you know, or say, we don't find this relevant. Um, but then at least the Court of Appeals has a better view as to the facts that, that you found, irrespective of, of all of the record that comes up. Okay. Um, questions or comments from board members? I'm not gonna. There's so few of us, I'm just gonna ask it generally rather than going down the list. But um, anybody um, have questions or comments? I appreciate the information, Diane. Uh, this is very helpful. Thank you. My pleasure. I, I hope it is. Any, anybody else? Oh, I see a thumbs up from Dr. Ponder, so. Thank you. All right. Um, one one quick comment. I, I know I'm probably the most vocal comment, and I sometimes have to apologize for that. But um, uh, I think it would be helpful if the board could be kept informed um, every month as to the status of an ongoing appeal. And if it's nothing more than you know, mediation hasn't been scheduled yet, or mediation was continued, um, or mediation was completed. Now it's going to be before circuit court and just some sort of update like that um, um, I think would be a, a little helpful to the board. Yes, ma'am. I, I think that part of the challenge is that the, um, the 14th Circuit is, is not necessarily, there, there's, there's not the same record that you would get from uh, a Court of Appeals in terms of what's been filed. And, and accessibility and 
often these cases are farmed out to outside counsel, either because of conflicts or wh whatever the reason may be. Um, but we certainly can do a better job of tracking where they are, when the mediation is, whether the applicant has requested mediation, and to, and to keep the board informed as to where it is in the process. That'd be great. And in the final note, uh, thank you very much for all the case law summary. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly very helpful, um, sometimes confusing, <laughs> but uh, very helpful. Um, but um, if there are any new cases that, that, uh, that come to your attention, that means um, that may mean that the board needs to either change its um, rules or procedure or to suggest that something in the LMO be amended, um, if you'll keep us apprised of those so that we stay on top of it. Yes, ma'am. I will, I will monitor um, what's, coming, what's coming forward out of the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. Right, sure. All right, anything else uh, from anyone about the training we've received today? If not, I'm, I'm sure Ms. Haley will, will uh, note our records for our additional training today. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bush, Ms. Lewick, and any other staff members who assisted with the presentation today. Um, and since this was a special meeting limited to um, this training today, um, with, with nothing else related to that, I'll give one pause. Then I will declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Y'all have a good day.